everyone my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am I post videos pertaining to a little bit of whatever I want conspiracy theories controversial people true crime vlogs so if you're interested in any of that you can subscribe and if not totally chill totally fine we are just here to you know do some makeup talk about some true crime this case is definitely a very frustrating case for many different reasons that you will see later on but there is a lot to get through so we are just gonna hop right into it but before getting into the rest of today's video I do want to give a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video BetterHelp. Mental health in the past couple of years has definitely been getting the attention it deserves and I feel like the whole topic of mental health is just so much more comfortable to talk about now and the normalization of talking about mental health struggles therapy has also been a very great route for people to take so if you find yourself feeling depressed anxious or overwhelmed better help is here for you better help offers licensed therapists that are ready to listen and help you talk to your therapist online or through a chat box there are also a broad range of expertise in better helps 20,000 plus therapist network that gives you access to therapists that may not be available in your area you simply just fill out a questionnaire to assess your specific needs then secure a video or phone conversation with your therapist plus you can exchange unlimited messages better help has personally helped me a lot with my time management and procrastination. I just never really knew how to time my task correctly and then due to that I would get more and more stressed as well as just finding a very convenient time management schedule that I follow with. And if you find a therapist that you're not really vibing with that is completely fine because you can just simply request a different therapist with no questions asked. Join the 3 million plus people that have taken charge of their mental health with an experienced BetterHelp therapist. Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp by going to betterhelp.com slash Haley Elizabeth. That's betterhelp.com slash Haley Elizabeth. Thank you once again to BetterHelp for sponsoring today's video. Now back to your video. On Thursday, August 20th of 2020 at around 5 a.m., that is when the Indiana police station received a phone call from the Sugar Creek Bridge in Indiana where a woman was calling very frantically saying that along her walk of the bridge, she had came across what looked to be a decapitated body hanging off the edge of the bridge. 911, where is your emergency? I'm on uh, North 225 West Road. There's a uh, body hanging off the bridge, no head. There's a car coming. Okay. There's, dead, there's a dead body. That's a deer. Are you sure? Yeah, but I'll back up and I'll say. <laughs> I'm on the phone with the cops now. Okay, she thinks it's a deer? Uh, no, it's a body. It's a body. Yeah, that's what I've seen with no head. I'm freaking out. Okay. I I never seen something like this. When the police show up to the scene of the crime, they do indeed find a headless middle-aged woman lying off the edge of the bridge. So the police then take the body into autopsy in hopes of running this person for fingerprints to try to identify this woman. While the police were trying to figure out who this person was, on the other side of town, the police station was also receiving another phone call from a man by the name of Michael Parks that was putting in a missing persons report for his wife, Hope Parks. Hi, my name is Michael Parks, and me and my wife, we kind of got into an argument Tuesday, and I haven't seen her, and I'm getting worried. Okay, um, what's her name? Hope. Somebody picked her up. She got into a car with somebody, and they left. It was either a, a silver or a white, like, Honda Civic the police then ask Michael if he could give a description of what Hope looks like, including one tattoo that was a heart with Michael's name in the middle. And after this, the police had asked Michael if he would be willing to come down to the Crawfordsville Police Station in Indiana for further questioning. And then that is when the police during their autopsy were trying to find a tattoo that matched Michael's description. And that is when they did indeed find a tattoo of a heart with the name Michael in 
in the middle confirming that this woman was indeed Hope Parks. Now when Michael got to the police station he was informed that the body they had found that morning had the tattoo of Michael's name but since they hadn't run the fingerprint testing yet they couldn't actually confirm that this was Hope. This could have might have been you know just a random coincidence but Michael prior to the interrogation was informed that this may be his wife's dead body. That is something major to keep in mind as you're listening to the rest of his interrogation. Now when Michael was brought into the station he was actually brought into what's called a soft interrogation room. Basically there's two types of interrogation rooms. There's a hard interrogation room where usually they will put like suspects of crimes in. It's a lot more intimidating and then you have a soft interrogation room. A soft interrogation room is usually well lit. It has a couch. It has plants. It's usually a place used for when interrogating children or victims of crimes. So they put him into a soft interrogation room to ask further questions. As far as Hope Parks, I couldn't find too much information about her, but the information that I did find about her, she was a very simple woman from Indiana. Her and Michael actually got married at a very young age when Michael was just 19 years old back in 1995. And up until the point of this crime in 2020, they had been married for about 25 years. And down the road, Michael and Hope would later on have two children, a son and a daughter, as well as the daughter later on moving out, getting married and having two kids of her own, a son and a daughter. And Hope absolutely loved being a grandmother playing with her grandchildren. She loved when her grandchildren would come and visit. She also had a dog that she would basically treat as if it were her child. She loved her dog so, so much. And so Hope as a person just seemed like such a kind-hearted, sweet lady. So from the outside, although this family seemed to be pretty normal, on the inside there were a lot of fighting within the household. Hope and Michael's son actually still lived with them because of their son's on and off substance abuse issues, specifically with drugs. He could not hold a job very long, therefore he couldn't really get that much money. This was the catalyst for a lot of their arguments. Michael, he basically just wanted to kick their son out, while Hope was a lot more gentle and just wanted to help her son get through this very tough time in his life. One day, Michael came home and he found his son's drugs inside of the house. This made Michael very, very mad. And so then that day, Michael had kicked their son out of the house without telling Hope anything. This basically just cranked up their arguments to a 10. Hope really wanted their son back at home where he was safe, whereas Michael just didn't really care what happened to his son. And then to make matters even worse, a couple days later, their son actually got a speeding ticket and their son was still on Hope's car insurance. So Michael had basically told Hope you need to kick him off of the insurance right now and basically just telling Hope to abandon their son. Obviously she didn't really want to do this. She wasn't ready to do this and so she basically told Michael that she would switch the insurances and take him off but she ended up never doing this and Michael then found out it was on that Tuesday. So during this big argument Michael had given Hope an ultimate ultimatum. He said, me or your son. This was obviously a very unreasonable thing for Hope to just choose between her husband or her son. Michael told her that she has until Friday to make up her mind and make a decision. Hope that night had went into the Honda Civic and drove off. Now it's Thursday, so it's two days later, and Michael still has not heard or seen Hope. This is the story that Michael tells detectives. This is the story that he's going with and right off the bat you can definitely see how Michael is sort of the ringleader in this relationship. He's the one who you know forced Hope to take their son off the insurance. He was the one who kicked him out without Hope's permission or even letting her know and it wasn't until the detective started to ask Michael a little bit more of questions where things started to get a little bit weirder since they were on the top of, you know, substance abuse issues, the detective had asked Michael, quote, 
does your wife have any alcohol or drug issues? And to this, Michael responds with, quote, no, she's just very controlling, which is kind of irrelevant to the question. That was kind of odd. And apparently this question or talking about his wife had just triggered something in Michael to where for the next 10 minutes of this interrogation, Michael basically just goes on a rant about his wife saying that she is controlling, that she never listens to people, that she does whatever she wants, that she's uptight. And you can see very quickly that the this like very worried husband act that he had on when he walked in completely came off in this moment because again, given the circumstances that he had just been informed that the dead body found that morning could possibly be his wife, these are very uncalled for. It seemed as if he had no worry or concern for his wife's well-being at this point. Within his rant, he talks about how his wife is controlling to everyone to which he he says, quote, which I'm used to it. It don't bother me. That is when the detective tries to basically ease down the conversation. Obviously, he's very thrown off that Michael is now saying all this terrible stuff about his wife, even though just 30 minutes before he was like a wreck trying to find his wife. He just says stuff like, oh, you know, that's understandable that you guys didn't see eye to eye all the time. You've been married for 25 years. Marriage is hard, so that's understandable. Michael literally just replies to that comment with, quote, I've gotten used to it. I take medication. I do have anger issues, but I take medication for it. I haven't done anything. Again, kind of odd considering nobody was saying he did anything. It just seems like Michael is using talking as like a coping mechanism to sort of keep himself distracted, which is a huge red flag because oversharing is a very big tell sign of lying. And so that is when the detective starts to kind of lean into this a little bit and he realizes that his son and hope make him the most angry. And so maybe if he can get him into that angry mind state, he may accidentally reveal something out of anger that he wasn't supposed to. So that is when the detective brings up his son. Michael replies with, quote, I want to hurt him. I hate to have to say this on recording, but I want to hurt him. That's why he had to go. And then after this, he goes on another rant, very similar to the one that he just had about his wife. Just that right there is a very bold statement because Michael is simply just confessing to the fact that he has violent tendencies towards his family. And then 10 minutes after this, he basically contradicts what he said earlier, talking about his wife, and he says, quote, She's controlling. My son does drugs, but I wouldn't hit him. I have anger issues, but I take medication, but I would never do anything. That is when the detective decides to switch the conversation from his son now on to his daughter. But to his daughter, he had nothing but great things to say about his daughter. He said that him and his daughter are really close. He says that typically his daughter is always the one to take his sides on things. So at this point, the interviewers, he decides to leave my Michael alone in the room for about 10 minutes while the detective fetches another detective to help him out on the interrogation. While the police are out in the other room, they're talking amongst themselves. They're like, you know what? This may come to a surprise but I think Michael had something to do with this. And they start, you know, conspiring up a plan, trying to figure out, okay, if Michael did do this, then we need a search warrant into his house or his car. But in order to get a search warrant, it's going to take us a very long time. And this is a very time sensitive situation. The detective goes back into the interrogation room and simply just asks Michael for permission if they could search his home and his car, to which surprisingly, Michael just says yes. He says, yeah, go ahead, search the house, search my car, and even give his written consent 
for the police to do so. That is when the detectives go out to search while the other detective stays back to continue to interrogate Michael. The police are at Michael's home for less than a minute and already the police end up finding blood on the gravel outside of the garage door and then they also went around to the side of the house into the backyard where they found even more blood in the grass, blood on their back patio, and blood on their ramp that leads up to the back patio. When the police were inspecting the blood that was found in the grass, they actually also found a bullet casing near where the blood was found. When the police actually get into the garage, that is when they found multiple blood splotches all over the garage floor as well as bloody footprints. When Michael was asked about this, he basically just said that he works on cars a lot. He's going to get injured every now and then. That blood was probably just blood from him accidentally cutting himself on something. As the police continue further throughout the home, they realize that everything else in the home besides the garage looks to be pretty clean as if, you know, everything was just kind of going about normal that day. But that was unfortunately until they reached the basement of the household. On the stairs leading down to the basement, they found multiple blood splotches. When the police went down into the basement, they were looking around and that's when they found this huge pile of flex ducts as if there was something obviously hiding under there. And they started to remove all of the flex ducts one by one. Underneath all of those flex ducts was indeed Hope's severed head. Hope's head was buried in a shallow hole in the basement and it was hidden in multiple shopping bags and covered in dirt. Well, immediately when the police find out about this head, that is when they call the interrogator that's talking to Michael right now. The interrogator leaves the room, he learns this information, and then when he comes back, now this detective is looking at Michael as a suspect and not a victim. So instead of learning more about Hope, he's now trying to learn more about what happened. With this, if the detective were to just tell Michael, hey, we found the head, we know it was you, this could be a very bad thing for him to do because this could lead Michael to retract and say, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. And in order to correctly charge Michael of his crimes, they need to know the full extent of what Michael did. The detective just tells Michael, quote, at your house, something happened, to which Michael replies with, quote, not with me. The detective then says, there's no one else it could have been. Then Michael shrugs his shoulders and just says, I don't know what to tell you. And it's very concerning that he shrugs his shoulders because it seems as if he's talking about something very nonchalantly, as if the situation at hand means really nothing to him. The fact that Michael just shrugs it off instead of becoming very defensive is also another tell sign of being guilty. If even you yourself, right, if you yourself were to go down to a police station right now and you're at this police station and and you're like being interrogated for a crime and all of a sudden the police say to you, hey, we think you murdered this person. Wouldn't you and your first response be like, no, I did not. How could you say that? I was here. I told you I was here. I have this alibi. I was doing this. There's no way I could have done this. Immediately very scared. You're very anxious. He instead just shrugs it off as if everyone does not know what they're talking about. The detective had said to Michael that they found everything in his home, to which Michael replies with, quote, What's everything? The detective says, her, the rest of her. Michael then replies with, okay, so what? Then the detective says, her head, we found everything. And to this, Michael simply gives a very dull and surface level response. What's everything? Her, the rest of her, the whole thing. So what? Her head. Yeah, we, we found everything. <laughs> just very 
chilling to watch that response to something as traumatic and graphic as that. At no point during the interrogation, he has showed no tears, no true concern or sympathy for the well-being of his wife. After his long sigh and he kind of sits back, he looks like he's thinking about something and that is when he tells the detective, quote, I don't know. I didn't do anything. Talk to my son. Michael is essentially just going to try to blame this whole thing on his son, even though at this point the detectives know for a fact that it was not their son, just purely based upon the timeline and also Michael's body language throughout this entire interview. He seems to be very calm, collected, and nonchalant, and so because of this, the detectives try to crank it up a notch. And the one detective says to Michael, quote, something happened to her at your house. You were the only one at the house that night. To which Michael replies with, quote, I guess this is the part where I need a lawyer because you aren't listening to me. So as a lot of you guys know, whenever someone requests to have a lawyer, that is typically when the interview stops and then we await for a lawyer to be present in order to continue the interrogation. In interrogations, the only way for you to get legal representation is if you say the words, I want legal representation. Whereas in Michael in this situation, he didn't say that he wanted it. He just said, quote, I guess this is the part where I need a lawyer, implying that he may need one, but just not yet. And so due to Michael's choice of words, they were still able to continue the interview. So as I said a while, a while earlier that the detective had brought in another detective to kind of help out with the situation, this other detective then tells Michael, quote, you're the only one at the house. You're the only one who could have known what happened to your wife. How does she lose part of her body in your house? To which Michael just simply shrugs it off and says, quote, no clue proving that Michael has completely no remorse for what he did. He's trying to shove it down and use coping mechanisms like oversharing or jittering. He's also getting up a lot during the interview and basically just pacing around the room. And that's when the detective says, quote, you have a clue. There's nowhere else for us to look. There's nowhere else for us to go. There's no one else for us to talk to about this. And that is when Michael cuts him off and says, quote, all right, I want a lawyer. And so since Michael said, I want a lawyer, that is when the interview had stopped. But the detectives and the police did have enough information and evidence to convict Michael. So Michael did not get to go home when he was in the station that day. He was immediately arrested and charged with the suspicion of murder of Hope Parks. A couple days later, while Michael is awaiting trial, that is when Michael randomly decides to speak with one of the detectives. But what was weird about it is that he actually requested to talk to a detective without a lawyer present. He got into a room with these two detectives and that is when Michael would begin to tell the real story of what happened that day. He says that on Tuesday, he got home from work early that day and ended up coming home at around 4 p.m. When he got home, their grandchildren were there just visiting. His grandchildren's visit was cut short, unfortunately, due to all of the arguing from Hope and Michael. To blow off some steam, that is when Michael went into the backyard to go practice shooting on some groundhogs. He says that he shot around three rounds into a tree and then after that, he went inside to go clean the gun. He said he went into the kitchen and sat down at the kitchen table while Hope was making dinner, and while he was cleaning off the gun, unfortunately, there was one more round still left in the gun, and as he was cleaning it, the gun had ricocheted and shot Hope in the head. But instead of calling for help, he instead decided to clean up the entire crime scene, and he says that everything after this point is just a blur. And the detective said that from the autopsy, it showed that there was indeed a gunshot wound to Hope's head, but it looked like the gunshot wound was around four to five feet away. So since his story wasn't really matching with any of the evidence that was found on the scene, that is when Michael starts to become a lot more desperate and you can sort of hear the desperation in his voice. At one point, the one detective leaves the room and Michael and this new detective start talking. I don't know why, but he's trying to basically throw Michael 
Michael a bone. And that is when the detective tells Michael, quote, what was your mental capacity at the time? Were you so enraged by an earlier argument that she mouthed off something and you don't remember what you did? Basically trying to tell Michael, hey, were you in the right mind state at the time? Was it something of, I don't know, reasons of insanity? But for some reason, Michael does not get what this detective is trying to do. And Michael simply just replies with, quote, nope, no arguments. I was just cleaning my gun. So the detective then tries something else. And he says, quote, okay, um, the gun. You ever had a problem with the rifle's trigger, uh, like it going off and you didn't want it to? Basically just telling Michael once again, hey, here's an angle you can try. Maybe if it's not your fault, it's the gun's fault. Maybe we can go after the manufacturer of the gun. But instead, Michael just replies with, quote, not that I know of, no. I didn't even have it for that long. Maybe a week, week and a half. And me personally, I don't know much about guns. And this was something that I was kind of confused about. After only having it for a week and a half, like it's a brand new gun, and then you go outside and then you shoot it only three times, and then you come inside and clean it. Is it normal to clean your gun after just only three rounds? Or is it still considered clean? The detective who was trying to give Michael a way out, he was basically talking about how Hope, since she is an older woman at this point, skin tends to, you know, droop and drag and wrinkle as you get older. It's not as like clean and tight as when you're younger. And so then the detective then asked Michael, quote, with each drag, he's talking about the knife to Hope's neck, with each drag, did the muscle and the skin move with it or was it just a clean cut? And to this, Michael replies with, quote, I don't even remember doing it. Then the detective replies, quote, okay, well, that's just the brain trying to protect you from typically the goriest and most traumatic details. I'm also assuming the detective asked that graphic question to try to get Michael back to the scene of the crime mentally so that he could truly figure out what happened and the timeline of when it happened. But since Michael doesn't remember anything, it's, as the detective said, due to, you know, trauma and trying to block out the goriest parts. At this point, that is when the other detective returns back into the room and he basically just tells Michael straight out that his story is not true. It can't be true because he says that when they were investigating the kitchen a couple days prior, they did not find any blood in the kitchen, nor did they find any bullet casings. And also cutting off someone's head is a lot of blood. So where did this blood go? Now, as for the basement where they actually found blood splotches, like on the stairs, on the floor, they also found a bunch of blood in the garage and on the side of the home on the back porch they found blood literally everywhere then where michael said the crime had happened this interrogation with police actually went on for an entire four hours of just michael going back and forth with the interrogators and the interrogators getting absolutely nowhere with michael at the end what they came to as a conclusion was that this was possibly reckless homicide, meaning that Michael did kill Hope, but he did not have the intention to kill Hope. While awaiting trial, that is when investigators would still continue to find very concerning evidence, especially Michael's search history. Michael's search history, they actually found evidence that would imply this crime was not only done by Michael, but it was also premeditated. In his search history, the police found things such as, quote, do bottle silencers really work as well as how to make bottle silencers? Now, if you guys don't know what bottle silencers are, they're basically silencers like homemade silencers that you put on guns and they're made out of plastic bottles. Right after looking up if bottle silencers really worked, he also looked up, quote, 
do pillows really silence gunshots? And these things were researched only two days before the murder of Hope, meaning that this was indeed a premeditated crime. This couldn't have been a heat in the moment. And even if he did hypothetically need a silencer to go like hunting in the woods, why would he specifically look up a pillow silencer? Isn't a pillow silencer kind of inconvenient when you're out in the woods hunting? This was, of course, a very, very big piece of evidence, and it made Michael look even more guilty. Michael's charge of reckless homicide was upped to first-degree murder. His trial date was going to be on May 9th of 2022, but then on May 6th, three days before his trial, up until this point he was pleading not guilty and then at the last second he decided to change his plea to guilty and accept a plea deal. Since Michael was indeed pleading guilty there was no trial held meaning that Michael never actually told the true story of what happened that day. He basically just took responsibility for the crime without even explaining the crime. On May 9th his actual trial date, Michael Parks would be found guilty for the first degree murder of Hope Parks, and he would actually be sentenced to only 50 years in prison. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison with no possibility of parole. He could possibly be released in the year 2070 at the age of 94 years old. As for today in 2022, Michael still is in prison. As far as Hope's Facebook page, it has been made into an in memory of Facebook page for people to basically just go back and remember and celebrate the life that she had lived. Michael hasn't really spoken to the press about the situation whatsoever, although there was this one press outlet that actually tried to reach out to him to ask him a couple of questions about the case, to which Michael said that he would not talk to this press outlet about the case until this press outlet had met his requirements. And his requirements were, quote, $300 into his commissary account, a fan, and specifically a 36 inch television shipped to the prison facility. This just really goes to show how Michael has absolutely no remorse or sympathy for what he did. And it's honestly just so frustrating, but it's so sad because Hope from what I could tell seemed like such a beautiful, wonderful woman. She just really cared about her son. She wanted to see her her son sober. She wanted to help her son get through it. Even like just learning more about her, how she was so family oriented. She loved being a grandma. She loved her grandchildren. She loved her dogs. Like again, she just seemed like such a simple, wonderful woman. And it's so tragic that her life had to end the way that it did. Even to this day, no one really knows what happened to Hope because Michael never came forward about the truth of the story. Michael still claims that he is guilty, but he still claims that it was all an accident, that his gun had ricocheted when he was cleaning it, and that is the story he continues to go with even to this day. When I was watching YouTube videos discussing the case, there was this one specific YouTube comment that I thought was very interesting, and it said, quote, he accidentally shot his wife, he accidentally killed her, he accidentally dragged her dead body down to the basement where he proceeded to accidentally accidentally cut off her head, then bury it. Then he systematically began to clean up the evidence, doing a poor job at it from all of the blood stains he left behind, including the rifle shell in the yard. And finally, he accidentally took her, dismembered her corpse to the bridge, and posed it up on the side of the railing. Yep totally believable. Clearly something else went on. There's no way that this was all an accident. What was the point of taking her body and putting it in such a public place, like over the railing of a bridge? It seemed as if Michael wanted hope to be found. As for my own thoughts and opinions on the case, I don't really have any. I have basically already kind of said everything that I have thought. At the end of the day, the only person that should be remembered from 
from this case is hope because hope is the one that suffered. Hope was the innocent victim that was brutally murdered in this situation. And this isn't, you know, the case of Michael Parks. This is the case of Hope Parks and what she went through and the life that she lived. I feel like that's always very, very important to remember when talking about these cases that although, you know, with true crime, the psychological aspects of it, the forensic aspects of it, it is very interesting. But if you could only take away, you know, one or a couple of things, just make sure that one of those things is the name Hope Parks. That is the end of today's video. If you guys enjoyed, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Um, if you want to follow me on any of my socials, like my Instagram, that will be linked down below, as well as my PO box if you want to send me anything. And as well as well, all of the makeup that I put on my face. So if you're wondering what these lashes are, what this lip is, all of that will be linked down below. And as well as well as well, all of the research that I use to create these videos. So if you yourself want to go ahead and do your own research, you can use Use those links down below as a good starting point and even if you go ahead and do your own research about the case and you find something that I did not mention or that I simply did not find in my own research and you feel like it's a very interesting thing to note make sure to leave that in the comments below I would love to hear your guys' thoughts about it as well as your overall thoughts about the case do you believe that Michael should have gotten life in prison or do you think 50 years was a fair deal do you believe Michael's story in that the gun had ricocheted by itself or do you think that there was some ulterior motive behind it and also I'm still curious if you guys know anything about guns or if you yourself if you know of people that shoot guns is it normal to clean your gun after three rounds or is that an odd thing to do I went for a very basic look today something I've been doing a lot recently is taking white eyeliner and putting it in the inner corners of my eyes as well as like on my nose and on the bridge of my nose. I've been seeing so many girls wear this sort of makeup look and I've been trying to recreate it but since my skin is sort of pale sometimes when I wear just like my pale skin and black eyelashes it makes my eyes look very weighed down. It makes my whole face look very washed out because there's no balance between the black eyelashes and my pale skin and that's another reason why I think I could never wear eyelashes eyelash extensions because it's literally just my black false eyelashes against my pale skin. That's basically all from me. Happy 2023. Um, first video of the year. I kind of took a little break. I took like two weeks off of YouTube because it was Christmas. Then after Christmas, it was New Year's and I just wanted to, you know, spend some time with my family and I hope you guys had a wonderful holiday as well. I have so many amazing things in the works right now that I'm so, so excited to show you guys. So, so yes, 2023 is going to be a great year for the both of us and I'm excited to see how far we get this year. But yeah, I'm going to stop rambling. That's all from me. I love you. I love you. I love you. And do something that makes you happy today.